Hey there, it's been a while. Uh, sorry about that. I've been dealing with an emergency the last few weeks, and unfortunately, that's probably going to continue for at least another month, probably two. Uh, I do feel guilty about that since there's been a surge of subscribers the last um, last several weeks. So um, to all those new subscribers, thank you. But in any case, uh, a viewer asked me uh, on how futures options were priced, and I answered in the comments, but he asked for a video about it, and since it's, on the scale of things, a relatively straightforward topic, I figured I would knock out a video on the subject. So, instead of just sitting here and yammering about it, let's jump into it and do this. So, for the equity options, I'm just going to use Apple as my example, and since I'm recording this on the weekend, this... Um, they, re they give you here the days to expiration. Uh, since this is already advanced by one, I'm going to add a day back into it to be uh, like Friday's uh, Friday's expiration. Uh, I'm going to take the, I don't know, I guess I'm going to take maybe the 160 strike um, and just plug in our black, plug in numbers to the Black-Scholes formula and hopefully we get out um, something that kind of resembles these numbers here. Now again, this is a weekend after hours, so these markets have widened up. These are normally pretty much a penny wide instead of, what is this, almost 20 cents, 20 cents wide here. Likewise, I believe the way uh, they calculate things is based on the bid ask price. I'm just going to take the last traded price over here because, um, you know, after hours trading, this changes. So I'm just going to assume that this is the uh, price of the stock here. And for the futures options, I'm going to choose gold because they're fairly liquid, even out a couple expirations. Well, a lot of options on futures, they only trade uh, the front month. And uh, oil trades a lot in all months, but there's a lot of geopolitical situations going on uh, right now as I record this. So things are kind of weird there. So I'm going to use gold, which is forward slash GC. And I'm going to pick a couple of these different changes, uh, option chains here, maybe uh, 45 days and then uh, 107 days. Let's just make sure this is liquid. Yeah, this is reasonably good. So these are the two, um, two option series that I'm going to look at for gold. And again, there'll be screenshots kind of put into the, uh, into the notebook. Okay, notebook. So I lifted this text from a video we did on calculating implied volatility. Black-Scholes uh, price of a call. Black-Scholes equation for the price of a put. This phi here is a cumulative normal distribution. Of course, S is the stock price, K is the strike, R is the risk-free rate, and T is the time to expiration in years, and sigma is implied volatility. So this is the same thing in code that implements those things. Um, here is the screenshot of our Apple prices. Uh, we're looking at the 160 strike price. It has an implied volatility of here, 32.51%. Um, again, I incremented the time by a day since uh, it's re being recorded on a weekend. We plug in these numbers and we get here, uh, according to the Black-Scholes model, the price should be about $4. $3.96 and this is the actual mid price of that 60 160 strike call um, you can make an argument that you sh should use the geometric mean rather than the arithmetic mean but you know who cares so pretty good the thing is there is only one price here which is the price of the stock so the, the price of the stock does not have multiple values in other words it's just a number so let's switch back over to Tastyworks. Here we go. And instead of Apple, let's type in our gold futures, forward slash GC. And you'll notice over here, look at here, you have a different last price depending on which series of options. So each of these refers to a different futures contract. This one refers to the futures contract that expires in, or at least the options expire in 10 days. This is a the futures contract here it's forward slash gcj2 down here you see it's gcm so the m stands for june and the j here stands for i think it's march is j let's see f is january f is january eight uh g is february h so j should be april so that's the april future here this is the june futures down here and they all have different prices so there are several things that kind of explain why these uh, different expirations have different prices. Um, 
to trade a gold future, you only need to put up about what the buying power reduction would be about, let's just call that $10,000 per contract. And the notional value is 100 times the price. So let's just round this to 2,000. So it's 2,000 times 100 is 200,000. So you're only putting up $10,000 to trade $200,000 worth of gold. Now, somewhere along the whole chain, that money has to be put up somehow. Uh, either by the counterparty or someone somewhere is putting up the full notional value of that trade for you. So in some way that interest, the interest on that money has to be kind of passed on to you. So, And so the longer the time, of course, the more amount of interest you're going to have to pay. Therefore, different prices, you know, is going to, it's going to depend uh, very much on which, which uh, future you are trading. Furthermore, there are storage costs, insurance costs that all have to be paid by you. If this were a stock index future, by trading the future, you're giving up the uh, potential dividends. For example, if you're trading E-mini S&P futures, um, the, you know, the stocks of the S&P, some of them throw off dividends, which you're giving up by trading the future. So somehow that has to be accounted for. So, so all those different factors I lump in, into the generic term cost of carry. So each futures contract is going to have a different price depending on the co cost of carry. And again, for stocks, it's a single price and the cost of carry was built into the Black-Scholes model. So let's switch back to the notebook and kind of write this all out in a more mathematical form. Uh, before going back to the notebook, let's choose, let's choose this option series here. So this is the, con this is the uh, spot price, spot price, 1997.2. This is the June contract, the M. So let's just pick a strike, I don't know, let's do the, let's do the 2010 call. So the mid price is 56 and change, so halfway between 50, uh, 56, 35 should be, roughly speaking, the option price. Implied volatility is a little over 21%. Okay, now let's go over to the notebook and type this out. And before the notebook, let me just say I didn't re-derive these myself. I just went to the Wikipedia page on the subject. Here is the equation for the call price for futures options, put price, and then the D1 and D2 values. So basically we just replace, in the D values, we replace the spot price or the stock price with F. And then the um, call and price puts, uh, prices are subtly modified here. So now let's go back to the notebook. This is the same thing. This is how we define the futures price now. So F is the spot price, and then it's modified by this E to the uh, risk-free rate plus whatever storage costs minus whatever dividends the underlying throws out. So if it's a stock index, it'd be the uh, dividends that that index puts out times, uh, of course, time. And I define these quantities here. These are our equations. Uh, remember, phi was what they called N. It's the cumulative normal distribution. Here's the same thing in code. And if you compare these to what I did up above, um, they look they look a little bit different uh, just because the uh, code I stole originally was a vectorized form to handle many things at once. This just does one contract at a time. Here's our quantities. Again, the spot price or the futures price was 1997.2. Our strike was 2010. Our risk-free rate is still the same, 46 days to expiration. Sigma was 21.72%. And here we go. So we run our code and we get a uh, call price of 55.4 and the actual price, the mid price is 56.3. So given that it's futures market, not quite as liquid as stocks, it's a uh, weekend, everything's closed. I figured that is good enough. Cool. So pretty straightforward. As usual, I will clean up the notebook, upload it to GitHub, and until next time, see ya.